Hello, chess fans. Welcome to another edition of Chess Chat, a program designed to give you, the viewer, a better understanding and a deeper appreciation of the exciting world of chess. I am your host, George Marijanian, Program Director of the Wachusa Chess Club at Fitchburg State College. This club meets every Wednesday evening from 7 to 11 in room C188 of the McKay Campus School at the college. And with me is once again my longtime co-host and trusty colleague, Martin Lane of Lunenburg, one of the strongest and most active chess players in North Central Massachusetts. Welcome, Marty. Hello, George. Good to see you again. Always a pleasure to see you, Marty. Marty, today we're going to depart from our regular format of Chess Chat, in which we usually present our viewers a, a game of a uh, celebrated player. Today we're going to focus our attention on an individual whose claim to fame is as being one of the, the greatest writers of the 20th century. And his name? Right. Vladimir Nabokov. Nabokov, right. And what do we know about Vladimir? Why are we bringing up Vladimir Nabokov? Was he a chess player? Well, he wasn't, certainly he wasn't a professional chess player, but he did play chess. And he had an interesting interest in something we call chess composition, which we'll talk about more later. Okay. But as you say, he was, he's best known as a novelist. Yes. It's even, he was born in Russia, uh, lived in various countries, England, Germany, France, the United States, and then finally Switzerland. So he's kind of a worldwide figure. And he's best known for the novel Lolita, oh. which is even better known than he is. And most people, when they hear, if they know the name Nabokov, they immediately say Lolita, which is something that happened at Chess Club the other night when we were, you and I were talking about this program. Yes, we did mention Nabokov. And, and one, of our, one of our members said, oh yeah, I love that novel Lolita. Yes. And you know, and that's, that's, he's forever associated both with the novel and the movie that uh, the first, the Stanley Kubrick 1961 movie, I think. Yes, it with, was. That was with Shelley Winters with, and, and James, James Mason. Mason. Yes, right. And um, that book was was considered by critics. A, it's considered a great novel, both in style, structure, theme. You know, as a work of art, they, they, it's it's always on every top ten list of great novels of the 20th century. But yes. because of its theme, because of its subject matter, it was also probably one of the most notorious modern novels. It, it was banned in France for several years before it was allowed. And it was parts of it were banned in the United States. It, it's about an obsession that a middle-aged man has for a young girl and he runs off with her. And this was a, broke all taboos. It took, um, it took Nabokov two years to find a publisher to do it. He sent it to Viking, Simon & Schuster. They didn't want to touch it. They wanted no part of this. I see. Finally, it was an obscure uh, Olympia Press published it. And it took off. It made him famous. Stanley Kubrick, um, you know, turned it into a film. Nabokov wrote the screenplay. He didn't really want to, mm -hmm. but he didn't want somebody else to write the screenplay of his novel. But his attitude towards it was, it's like trying to sketch a painting you've always already finished. Right. He said he just he just wanted to get it down and out. And he once said, uh, Lolita is famous. I am obs I am <laughs> obscure, doubly obscure novelist with yeah. an unpronounceable name. Yes. He, was, he was always in trouble because people could not pronounce his name correctly. I so see. he wrote this little, he also taught English in different places. He wrote this little ditty for students to help with the pronunciation. He goes, the querulous gawk of a heron at night prompts Nabokov to write. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is how he would teach them about, um, about his, his name. But he led, he led a life that was tremendously interesting. He was, well, as you say, he was born in Russia, right, in St. Petersburg, Petersburg, Russia. St. Petersburg, 1899, April of 1899. Now, how did he describe his child? Did he describe his child as a perfectly normal... Trilingual child? child. He was a, a trilingual child. How many trilingual childs do you know right. uh, uh, brought up? In fact, wasn't it that he learned English, could read, read and write right. English right. before he could read and write right. Russian? Russian right. He was born in Russia. And what did he, ha he also learned, he had governesses, governess, English? Yeah, right, he had a French-speaking governess who didn't speak Russian or English. Okay. And so he grew up, so he grew up in a, first of all, in a very wealthy family. Yes. They had, a, you know, they had their house in St. Petersburg and a country place that, where they spent their summers 
uh, some 50 miles or so outside of St. Petersburg, a country estate. Right. There's a photo of, a, of, of, of uh, the right. Boca Bolita photo right. when he was in this country. Yeah. And uh, so when in his household, um, his parents spoke both Russian and, and English. His father was something what they call an Anglophile. He, he oh. was active in Russian politics and, and government. And he was kind of a reform-minded sort of gentleman. He, he wanted to model um, the Russian, the, a, a sort of, he wanted to reform Russia so they would be more like England with a less, monarchy. Of, less of an absolute monarchy. Okay. A monarchy nevertheless, less, but yes. more democratic, a, a functioning parliament, functioning legal system, which Russia didn't really have at the time. He wound up in trouble at one point. He wound up in, his father wound up in jail for a few years because he criticized the czar. Yes. Um, but nevertheless, he wasn't, he wasn't so extreme. He wasn't as extreme as the Bolsheviks. So yes. he, was, he was neither far left nor far right. He was kind of in the middle, kind of a reformist. And so when the, the revolution came on, the family had to flee. They had to flee. This St. was after the February for Revolution, 1917. Right. Right. Where, where, where did they flee to? Uh, uh, Sebastopol. In, in the Crimea? First, in the Crimea first, okay. thinking that this whole thing might end and blow over and they could go back. But right. that didn't happen. So then they needed, then they fled from there. They took the last boat, literally the last boat out of Sevastopol to England, to Europe, uh -huh. and settled in England for two years. Now, what did Vladimir do? When, when the family arrived in England, did, uh, did Vladimir go, go to school? Right, what he did, he, at that point, he was 18 years old or so, 18 or 19 years old, about 19, I guess. Yes. And he uh, enrolled in Trinity College, part of Cambridge University. Okay. Where he studied Slavic, Rom uh, Slavic and Romance languages and literature. All right. But he also had this tremendous hobby of collecting butterflies, Ooh. which he took up as a young child. So, so, so this was a passion of his, right, a real butterfly passion. collecting. Yeah. And here we have a photo uh, of, of uh, uh, the book of with a butterfly net. And this was taken in Switzerland, Switzerland where right. he eventually moved to. But this is a great, great photo of the book of, right. um, and he really fell in love. I mean, he right. fell in love with writing in languages and chess. And butterfly, butterfly. Right. In fact, he, wasn't he considered actually a foremost authority on uh, lepidoptery? Yeah, he was a, considered an expert in, in lepidoptery and in, in uh, the study of butterflies, and he was largely self-taught. Oh, and, really? Right. He, took, so he, no, he had no formal education in entomology. I see. And in fact, his first English language article was to a journal called Entomology. It was about Crimean butterflies. I see. And uh, in, his, in his autobiography, he writes really quite beautifully about um, his first experience with butterflies. Just okay. Excuse me for You're going to read a passage from his, from his autobiography? About this is, this is his, his first encounter with, with a butterfly. Okay. This should be a rather interesting uh, passage. If I can find it. Because he is, you know, he, he was a phenomenal writer as far as, you know, using language, I mean, using alliteration, okay. so word, was, word he was, play. He was seven years old at the time. Okay. Because on the honeysuckle, overhanging the carved back of a bench just opposite the main entrance, my guiding angel, whose wings, except for the absence of a Florentine limbus, resemble those of Fra Angelico's Gabriel, pointed out to me a rare visitor, a splendid pale yellow creature with black blotches, blue crenels, and a cinnabar eye spot above each chrome-rimmed black tail. As it probed the inclined flower from which it hung, its powdery body slightly bent, it kept restlessly jerking its great wings, and my desire for it was one of the most intense I have ever experienced. That was his first contact first, with the butterfly. At, at the age of seven? At the age of seven, he caught this butterfly, and he was, he was caught. You know? Yes. And then he, in a, in a kind of an interesting combination of chess and butterfly hunting, he talks about a time when he encountered a rare, a rare butterfly. He saw a rare mm -hmm. butterfly, so he wanted to catch it. Yes. Okay. So he says, I remember one day, when I warily brought my net closer and closer to an uncommon hair streak that had daintily settled on a sprig. I could clearly see the white W on its chocolate brown underside. Its wings were closed and the inferior ones were rubbing against each other in a curious circular motion, possibly producing some small blithe crepitation pitched too high for a human ear to catch. I had long wanted that particular species and when near enough I struck. You've heard champion tennis players moan after muffing an easy shot. You may have seen the face of the world-famous Grandmaster Wilhelm Edmondson when, during a simultaneous display in a Mintz cafe, he lost his rook by an absurd oversight to the local amateur and pediatrician, Dr. Schach, who eventually won. But that day, except my older self, could see me shake out a piece of twig from an otherwise empty net and stare at a hole in the tarlatan. So he was equating this loss of 
getting this to a, a higher rated player, a grandmaster losing to an amateur. I see. All right, so we have him studying at Trinity College in, right. ca in Cambridge. Now, he, co he completed his studies there. He was in England, right. but did, the, did not the family yeah, the move? Family, the family fairly soon moved on to Berlin. Yeah, without where, him. He without was still, him, he, he needed to finish his studies. All right. And uh, there was a large Russian emigre population there at the oh, time. In fact, in Berlin, Germany had a sizable, after World War I, there was a sizable uh, emigre, Russian emigre community right. in Berlin, right. Germany. Right. So then once he finished his studies, yes. then he joined his family in Berlin, where he started to take up, he started to try to establish himself as a writer. Yes. And he had, you know, he published some articles, translations, Right. Uh, a few things like that, but nothing, nothing to be able to support him. So he wound up supporting himself by giving tennis lessons, tutoring in English, yeah. and also uh, boxing lessons. Really? Oddly enough, he gave boxing right? lessons. But he yeah. also took up. He also started compo making chess compositions, ah. creating these chess problems. So was there when he started? Uh, no, he actually started. No, at the same time he started poetry when he was seventeen. He composed his first chess problems, but he didn't oh. start publishing them trying to publish them until, until he got to, to Germany. Berlin, Germany. Then he took that up, and, and there was a, uh, another Russian emigrate uh, chess grandmaster, Eugenio Znosko Borowski. Oh, Znosko Borowski, a very right. famous Russian right. grandmaster, right. Znosko Borowski. Yeah. Right. He helped him by publishing a few of those chess compositions. Well, at, while he was in Berlin, he came into contact with a German master, a much older gentleman named yes. Kurt um, von oh. Bardeleben. Oh, Bardeleben. Right. Yes, a German right. master. A German master. Who, when, who was quite a bit older, he was in his 60s by this time when and, yes. uh, Nabokov was only in his 20s. Right. But he came into contact with him. And Bartolaben's claim to fame was that when he was a young man, he was considered a very promising player, considered well, he, to be very he, talented. In fact, he was one of the leading players of Germany. When he was young, yes. right. And then his, his moment, his sort of big moment came at Hastings 1895, yes. the big tournament there, when he was leading the tournament, and all he needed to do was to beat the former world champion, Wilhelm Steinitz. Yes. And he's, he had a good game going, and then Steinitz found a winning combination that he could not get out of. Oh, okay. And so instead of resigning, what he left he a note that said, I saw it. And then he got up and he left the table yeah. without resigning, forcing Steinitz to wait until his clock ran out to be able to claim the win. Yes, that's very unprofessional. <laughs> uh, yeah, unsportsmanlike. Uh, unsportsmanlike, too, yeah. But all of Bartleben's acquaintances, uh, everybody who talks about him, says that after that he was never quite the same. He didn't, he never achieved that kind of greatness that people thought he might. Well, uh, Bartleben had a very tragic life. You know, right. a after World War One, especially being a German player, right. after World War One, he suffered. He was, he went into poverty. Right. And and you know how he ended his life? <laughs> he jumped out of a rooming house window. He committed suicide by jumping out of a window. Yes, a rooming right. house. Yes. Right. A tragic life right. for uh, a very promising German player. Yeah. So, so Nabokov certainly would have been would knew him. Yes. And would have been familiar with this story. Right. And at the at this time he had already he had written two novels or two early novels, and then he said he got this idea for his third novel, which is really his first great novel. It was, the Russian title is The Lutzen Defense. The translation into English is simply The Defense. The Defense. Now, it's interesting, though, and a lot of commentators say that he modeled the main character, Lutzen, yes. who, who, as a young child, they find out that he's, gift, he's a gifted chess player, mm -hmm. and he becomes obsessed with the game. He comes, becomes obsessed with this idea that he's got a winning, foolproof defense that he's going to use against the world champion, has a breakdown, yes. and in the end, he jumps out of a window. Oh, he jumps out, out of a window. window. So, there's yeah. this idea so that he models, he yeah. models it, and yet in his introduction to the book, Nabokov never mentions von Bartleben. This is what he says about when he got the idea. Okay. I began writing it. Um, I began writing it in the spring of 1929 at Le a small spa in the Pyrenees, where I was hunting butterflies, and finished it the same year in Berlin. I remember with special limpidity a sloping slab of rock in the Ulex and Ilex clad hills where the main thematic idea of the book came to me. Some curious additional information might be given if I took myself more seriously. Hmm. Nabokov had a real sense of humor. And yes. That's, that's all his books are like that. Yeah, it's expressed uh, in his writings. Right. And he, he, even, he even expresses this book and all of his, this really comes to how he writes all his work. He says, rereading this novel today, because he translated it 30 years later. It wasn't translated into English until actually after Luida came out, even though it was written yes. in the 1920s. Rereading this novel today, replaying the moves of its plot, re replaying the moves of its, its plot, plot. Okay, <laughs> I feel rather like Anderson, 
fondly recalling his sacrifice of both rooks to the unfortunate and noble Kizaritsky, who is doomed to accept it over and over again through an infinity of textbooks with a question mark for monument. My story was difficult to compose, but I greatly enjoyed taking advantage of this or that image and scene to introduce a fatal pattern into Luchin's life and to endow the description of a garden, a journey, a sequence of humdrum events with the semblance of a game of skill, and especially in the final chapters with that of a regular chess attack demolishing the innermost elements of the poor fellow's sanity. I so he, the, to him, the whole book is a chess game. Wow. And that, this is how he approaches most, most of his writing. As a chess player. As he a thinks, chess player. He thinks, he thinks a chess like player. a chess player, chess player. He and he writes, applies that. He applies that to his chess. And he once said that a novel is really between the author and the reader. It's not between the characters. And if you think of a chess game, two players opposing, yes. it's between the two players. The pieces are just being moved. And that's, that's how he views the characters in his books. I see. And all his stories. And it, okay. he uses that same. That's a key to understanding uh, his work. Okay, so he completed he com completed this novel in, in, in Germany, yeah. 1920. You say 1929. Yeah, 1929. Okay, now it was in Germany that he met his wife. We actually, right. his wife, uh, her first name was Vera. Vera. Yeah. Her last name was last name was Slonim. I think we have a photo of yeah. uh, of uh, uh, Nabokov playing his wife Vera, right. whom he met at a charity ball. I understand. Right. Yeah. There's his wife Vera on the left, uh, pl playing uh, uh, Nabokov. And, and, and she was a pa she was a passionate chess player right. too. And I think you mentioned that she, he actually met her through playing with his her father. Oh yes, in fact, her, in fact, Nabokov was playing her father before he met her. Right. Because he her her father was in charge of a publishing publishing firm, right. and he was trying to get work. You know, right. publishing his works or, or translate right. translating works into English. Uh, so he got to know the father before he was introduced to the daughter, right. and uh, and she was invaluable to her in him in his life because first of all Nabokov never never drove he never had a, right. li a, a, a driver's license right. so on these butterfly uh, you know trips, hundred and fifty thousand miles in the United States alone they she drove him so she drove so w w now when did he come he came to the United States now right. what's the story well, let's go back to this interesting yeah. quick anecdote about okay. their first date. Their oh, first date. I don't, tell me about the first they date. Met, they met at night on a bridge yes. in Berlin, and she came to him wearing a mask, reciting his poetry. Oh, really? <laughs> she, <laughs> she believed in his literature, and yes, she became almost like his manager. Yes. She took care, made sure, she took care of all the day-to-day -day stuff, right. got him where he needed to be, right. took care of things so that he could devote his life to his butterflies and to his writing. That's what he wanted to do. So, Okay, Hitler's rise in Germany made things uncomfortable in Berlin. Right. He moved, they moved to France. Okay. okay they stayed there 10 years. Mm -hmm. Hitler invaded France, things got uncomfortable. 1940, yes. 1940, right. he borrowed money from Rachmaninoff. Really? Yeah, the pianist, the Sergei Rachmaninoff, the pianist and composer. Oh, by the way, let me show you a side. Also a chess player. Yes, and you know the Sergei Rachmaninoff, did you know that he performed the recital at Leominster? Really? Yes. I didn't know that. There was a piece written in the Central Enterprise about more than 10 years ago it was a, there was a story that Andrea Clark, who's well known right, historian, yeah, I know Andrea. and she said that Rachmaninoff appeared in Leominster and performed the recital, recital at Leominster City Hall. Oh, so so that's a little side yeah. note to Rachmaninoff, the yeah. composer. So, but getting 1940, back to he comes to New York, and uh, he's, he comes under kind of the sponsorship, mentorship of a very prominent critic at the time, a gentleman named Edmund Wilson. Oh, he was one of the preeminent pre literary critics, a writer. Critics. He recognized Nabokov's. Uh, uh, you know, his, skill. his talent, uh, yeah, yeah, skill talent, and yeah. talent. And, and so he, um, the, he worked for a while at the New England, at the New York uh, Natural History Museum. Right. But fairly quickly, Wilson got him a position at Wellesley College. Ah, doing what? what well, what? teaching Russian language and literature. He became the Russian department, because there was nobody else there. So, what, so Wellesley Co College had no, no, Russian, no, Russian, no Russian language department? No. He so was, he, he was the one-man person. So it was a one-man one department, department, and right. so he found, basically he founded the Russian department at right. Wellesley College. Right, Wellesley College. And at the same time, he was working at the Harvard Museum of Comparative uh, Zoolo Zoology. Zoology. Right. Organizing their butterfly collection. Oh, I can imagine they so, were they were and writing, <laughs> writing at the same time. Right. So, okay. Yeah, so he had this multi talent. So he was a Wellesley, right. and then now did he teach else? Now did he then stay at Wellesley? He moved. He moved on to Cornell. Okay. Um, and I forget the year exactly, but that is where he wrote. He he he. That's where he wrote Lolita, and also this autobiography, Speak Memory. Right. And um, and he stayed there until 
1959, because then the fame from Lolita, for the first time in his life, gave him enough money that freed him up yes. to be able to do what he wanted. He didn't have to teach. He didn't have to catalog butterflies. He moved. He and Vera moved to Switzerland, uh -huh. and uh, that's where he, he lived until 1977 when he passed away. When he died, away. yes, yeah. yeah. And you know, it's interesting. I, I read that he, his, his way of, of, of you know, maintaining a manuscript was on index cards. Right. That he's, you know, some writers back then would do on yellow legal pads. But he kept all his writings, his manu manuscripts, on three by five index cards. I mean, right. how many? I don't know how many writers do that or right. did that. Or did but that. Uh, that's an interesting fact yeah. about Nabokov. So, do we so, want to do we want to yeah. get this problem here? Let's, Let's okay. So, so he uh, was passionate about chess. He used chess, to incorporated in his, in his, in his, his art, writings, yeah. uh, and and. It was during this time in Berlin that he, you know, started composing, you know, seriously prop, composing, prop. right? But he actually composed throughout his life, right? Uh, especially after he moved to Switzerland, he had all more time to compose problems. So maybe we should present our, our viewers some of the problems he composed. Right. We have one on our board, and I think our, our director Darren Dame actually has this uh, on a. We have a graphic. Of, of a, what we call a fairy, this is called a fairy chess problem. Right. Now a fairy chess problem is not your regular type of chess problem. It's one in, involving where maybe one side helps the other may, may, you know, be mated. But this is a case, this position in front of us is a case where it's a, take, where white, it's, white is gonna take back a move. It's white's move, but white in this position is gonna take back his last move, and by taking back the last move, he's going to be able to checkmate black in one move. So this is this is the problem. You know, you have to be a Sherlock right. Holmes to do retroactive re retrograde analysis. Right. So we got this very interesting position here. So what could have White's last move been to to be a, what what move? Could have been last White's last move, where he could have played something different to mate black in one move. Well, and it's not easy. Well, first of all, we would look and say, well, gee, the the black, uh, the white queen rather is threatened. White black could take it immediately. So you're, you're thinking, well, he he wouldn't have moved his queen into that position on right. the last move because that would just be a giveaway. Right. Yes. Exactly. So the queen's so under attack. Yes. Right. That. Right. And the, the queen is pinning one of the rooks against the black king. So that's one. Right. Also. Then you look at the white rook and the black queen. Well, why couldn't? Why didn't he just take? You know, you, you, how did that rook get there? You start asking the question: How did that rook? How get did this? There? How did this rook, rook get, here? get there without? You know, without taking the queen. I mean, exactly. We, so if the, yeah, right. How did that rook get here without being able to take this right. queen? I mean, right. so so you're thinking, well, that makes no sense. He wouldn't just leave the position. And right. He's got to solve these two problems. So now you have to sort of assume that maybe the rook wasn't there. So wasn't where did the there. Rook, where did, how where did the rook come from? He's got right. no. We're the only other. Well, the square that he could have moved from would have been the one right next to it. That doesn't change anything. Right. Oh, so, well, he, well, right. what's the other way? He would have had to have been promoted. Promotion. Okay. Right. So, which, which so, is which is. So this rook was not here. here. There was this, a black piece there. Or there was actually a, a white, white, pawn, white pawn. Let's put a white pawn. Mm -hmm. So actually, the the position that actually appeared on the board was this with with another, white with, with and a black with, piece on. So there had to be a a, a black piece. Right. Uh, right. It couldn't be. It, it, it couldn't be a. Uh, it couldn't be a, another. We already have the yeah, two. We rooks. have the other rook, so it couldn't be another rook. Okay. So it had to be either. Ah, but also uh, uh, maybe it's. Could it have been a knight? Right. Or it would have knight? to be a piece like that. It have to be a bishop or a knight, because as you say, the two bishop, the two right. rooks are already on the board. But this knight also adds further protection to this rook right here. Right. Okay. So, if this were the position, let's assume this is the position, then what white could do. Is to capture this. The, the D pawn captures the knight on C8 and promotes it not to normally you promote to, to a to queen, a queen right. but in a case like this, if you promote, it, let's promote it to a rook. Right, you could have okay. promoted it. Oh, to no. a, okay, or a queen. Or queen. Right. Wait, this is the position now. Right. Okay, so. but no. Here's here's the problem. That is, it, we, yeah, if we promote it to a rook. We reach the position on the board, right? But we're not going to do that, right? So and if, if we have to be able to 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 che to mate in one move, right? In order to move to checkmate in one move, we have to take this pawn on on d7 and capture the rook on e8, right? And not take a queen, another queen, but take a. Do we have another knight available to promote this to? Now, if we take another knight, 
and promote that to E8, this knight now checks the king, at, defends the rook, which the king was attacking, right. but, but also uh, uh, not, does not allow the rook to capture this knight that's checking the king because the, the, the rook is pinned to the, the queen. So this is a checkmate in one move. Right. Okay, so this is the solution. Yeah. These are not hard. No. Uh, again, the, the, the fairy chess problems are very rare in, in the in, in the but problem. they're hard hard to compose. They're hard to compose. And did, and did you tell me that he considered this his his favorite? This he considered this his favorite. His, this, this this problem he considered this was his, his favorite. favorite. He dedicated it to Zanosko Borowski. Yes. Uh, he created it um, much later in life, uh, right. I think, um, or maybe right. not. No, he did, okay. came back to it. All right. You know, do we have time to present? Actually, I'd like to present to our viewers, you and I. What my favorite in the book of problem, if we can do that. Sure. And we actually, if we look at our background here, okay. uh, yeah. we, we can, can take we this. That? But actually, can we set it up actually on the, on the board here? Sure. So our viewers can have a better idea. Okay, so let's put now the rook on A1. And where's the king here, here. And I think we have be just one, another pawn, black pawn. And another another black pawn, pawn there. I'll put one a black pawn. Okay, so this is the position with one white pawn here. So this is my favorite in the book of problem. And, and in this a sense, is this even, is much more practical. Yeah, this is not a fairy problem. This is right. a practical thing where it's white's move and white. Now, again, you know, most problems, one side has an overwhelming amount of material. They got, they got well, win. white wins. White no, wins. Yeah. The question is the, the economy. The, right. How economical can you be? How fast can you deliver the checkmate? Right. Well, here's a problem where the fastest checkmate possible is done in three moves. Three moves. But right. how do you do that? Right. How do you do a checkmate in three moves? Now, as you look at the position, how many moves? It's white's move. White's move. But look at actually how many moves does black have in this position? Well, he has a. He, he can move any number of places. Yes, he has, with the king, he can move to right. a7, to b7, to b8. So, so he has these three squares so, with the king. Right. But he also has the, uh, the, the, the right. pawn moving to a2. Right. All right. So what we want to do, the solution to this, is restricting the movement of this king. Right. And there's only one move. If we want to stop the king from moving to the seventh rank here, either a7 or b7, there's only one move that stops that. Right. And that is yeah, bringing that queen, queen down to here. All right. Down to a, h7. A, 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 h7. Right. All right. So now the king only has, now there's only two moves now for black. Right. It's either the king can go to b8 or the pawn can go a2. There's only two moves. It's process of elimination. So what happens if we push the pawn to, say we push the pawn to a2. Well, no, actually what I'll do is let's move the king. Let's try to make an escape. Okay. We go king to b8, all right? So now what white, white does, we want to stop the king from going back to a8. And the way you do it is you take rook takes a3. Right. King now is still, king only has one move. Right. c8, and the, the mate on the third move is rook a8 checkmate. Right. All right, so we don't move the king. So in this position, instead of moving the king here, let's push the pawn. Right. Okay, now we can, if, we, if this rook takes the pawn, we still cannot checkmate in three moves. Not in three moves. I mean, the yeah. king can run for run, a while. Yeah, the, run, the king can right. run. So the, the key is we're, we're trying to restrict right. it. So the key moves. move is to, uh, to do what? He's going to bring the queen. the queen back. Yes, and that's the key. That stops the king because the pawn is from pinned, moving to the B file, right? And it's pinned because the, the pawn cannot take the queen because it's pinned to the rook. Right. That forces the king up to this square, a seven, and then the checkmate is done move. by capturing rook takes right. a two. Mate mate. Next move. Okay, well, chess fans, we have presented uh, Vladimir Nabokov, one of the celebrated writers of the 20th century, who had a passion for chess, also butterflies, but. Uh, he composed chess problems and he incorporated chess into his writings. Uh, he was a very talented and a, a, a skilled writer. And uh, we wanted to present you not a game of Nabokov because he was noted for his chess compositions. And uh, I hope you enjoyed what Marty and I presented to you about the, the life and times of Vladimir Nabokov, the great chess writer, chess composer and writer. See you next time on Chess Chat. Oops. Right. Okay. Too fat.